Welcome to our Caribbean and African Targeted Health Improvement Program, CAFIP Health Hour. The Caribbean and African Health Network, CAN, along with its national partners, are incredibly pleased to continue to bring to you targeted health and well-being education delivered by Caribbean and African doctors. These health hours are all about empowering, educating and giving space to black people so our communities can look after themselves better. Every Saturday, our black GPs or consultants present on those health and well-being topics that affect you, your family members and friends. Some weeks will vary and will include other panel members such as pharmacists, specialist nurses and faith leaders. Our health hours cover a range of topics and include mental health, heart health, women's health, reproductive and sexual health issues, men's health, respiratory problems, cancer, sickle cell and many more. We have not forgotten to include within our health hours the many societal, cultural, religious and racial challenges that can go hand in hand with health problems and influence how we should respond to meet health and well-being needs. The sessions are designed for you and we want you to use the time to listen, learn, share your experiences and ask questions to our black doctors. During every session, we will gather your feedback so we can continue to respond to the needs of our black community. To request any particular topic, please email health at khan.org.uk. We encourage you to invite others to our Health Hour sessions. Spread the word in our community. CATHIP is funded by the National Lottery Community Fund. Hello and good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Sunday um, Health Network presentation. Today, we are joined by a fantastic speaker, Dr. Von Schuro, who is taking time from her maternity leave to share her wonderful knowledge around cervical cancer. Dr. Von Schuro is a GP qualified from St. George's London for her medical degree and also um, had has a degree in medical law and ethics from King's College, both in London. She is currently the publicity and social media lead for the first five group of young GPs in Lincolnshire. She obviously has a special interest in medical law and ethics, as well as holistic and mental health. Um, she enjoys time with her family. She's happily married and has two handsome sons who also love animals and farm visits. And in her spare time, she likes cooking, singing, writing and playing basketball. So welcome, Dr. Von Shuro. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Can I just uh, do a little addition since uh, the bio was written? I'm actually on maternity with two twin girls who are 10 months. So I'm a mom of four now. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, thank you so much for having me uh, on the Caribbean and African Health Network. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for taking the time to educate yourself, to empower yourself, for us to have this conversation. My desire, even though we're time pressured, is that it's a little bit of a two-way conversation. And it would be nice to just get a little bit of um, contribution from you, either if you raise your hand, if you want to answer something or ask something, feel free to interrupt me at any point. Um, or you can type in something and then um, uh, uh, Donobaru will kindly help us by uh, reading your questions or your comments even. I'm happy for us to be, uh, for this to be quite interactive. So um, shall we proceed? Yes, good to go. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen. And don't know Barry, if you can just confirm that you can see that okay for me. Right. Yes, that's fine. Wonderful, wonderful, brilliant. Okay. Now with a show of hands or maybe a little vote in the chat, I just want to know um, uh, the 
how many people in the last or in the last few years have had a smear, cervical smear? How many of us here in the talk have had a cervical smear? So I'd like you to vote. Just a quick poll there as we start our uh, presentation. Um, and if you're really brilliant, uh, you can also write when last you had your smear. That will be fantastic. Yes. So, um, right. Thank you for that introduction. I won't bore you into talking a lot about, you know, my job, but basically I am a GP. And what that means is I'm a general practitioner um, who are the doctors in the UK who provide primary care, or they're also known as family physicians. Now, of relevance, I mean, we have so many roles that we play in our community. And we, at the moment, we are really emanated with quite a, a lot of work, which you might see in the media, issues to do with workload. But of relevance to this talk, my role primarily involves health promotion, disease prevention, as well as uh, early detection and management of disease. So this is why I was very interested, even on my maternity, to make this small contribution to our community to make sure that we are empowered. Um, and as you have seen on the advertisement, the health inequalities around this subject are very, very shocking and very saddening for me. You know, I couldn't actually relax even though I'm on maternity. Um, just thinking about the fact that, you know, black women are 46, over 40% more likely to get cervical cancer. And if with women from, uh, from, from other backgrounds, i.e. white women who've been studied, we're actually 75% more likely to die from cervical cancer as well. So these are really shocking figures. And I'm hoping through this conversation, we're going to talk about things that we can do. And obviously, there's the usual generic things that we talk about, the importance of healthy living, um, smoking, alcohol, exercise, diet. We're talking about safe sex. We're talking about, you know, body awareness. We're talking about empowering ourselves with knowledge. Now, screening pro programs in the UK, we're very, very fortunate um, in that we have a very functional screening program, which I'll talk about in more detail later on. But I was just talking to a colleague of mine who was based in South Africa, and she was just sharing their statistics of how, um, the mortality there was even higher because the screening programs, they are much worse in sub-Saharan Africa. I haven't looked at other regions like West Africa or um, even the Caribbean, but I'm sure, you know, the trend is pretty much the same. And so um, hopefully we can take a lot of lessons from the UK program and also as we are engaging with this, make sure that we are uh, up to date with the smears. I can see a lot of hands. Um, I don't know uh, um, if we can, someone can count those hands for me just so that we can check by the end of the cons of the presentation as well. So one of the tech messages that I want you to get from my role is that GP is open. I know COVID happened and there was a lot of mixed messages in the media. Also, people had lots of difficulty in terms of accessing care in different settings. And I know that's brought a lot of frustration, but cancer and particularly cervical cancer is one of our top priorities. And anyone who is concerned about cancer, have symptoms that they worry could be cancer, should not hesitate to contact their GP. I, I, almost promise you, <laughs> I can't guarantee what all surgeries do, but I promise you they will take you very seriously and you will almost always get a face-to-face -face appointment very quickly. This is because we have the two-week pathway, which most clinicians, if you're a clinician here, you will know, where we are trying, the government is trying to promote early detection of cancers by making sure that everyone is seen um, after referral, is seen and reviewed, and has those initial investigations in the first two weeks. What that means is within a month, somebody should be having a diagnosis. We should be knowing where things are and, and, and now starting to plan treatment. This is quite important because, as we will see in detail as I go on with the presentation, the earlier you can catch something, if it does happen, 
then the better. There's the old cliche that prevention is better than cure, but sometimes, you know, these things happen, they fall through the net, and we are human, we are broken, and we end up suffering illness and disease. And the important thing is just to make sure that your healthcare providers are there for you and you do your bit by being health conscious and also seeking timely help when you are concerned. I thought to just make a highlight as well, because since COVID, because of the access issues, there's been widespread funding to help surgery increase access to healthcare through different um, virtual uh, tools. So you may already be familiar with this from your experience as a patient. Tools like Ask My GP, eConsult. Have a look at your surgery's website to see that if you think you can only make an appointment by telephone call or, um, uh, or maybe face-to-face, if you look at your surgery's website, sometimes they've got this virtual tooth tools, including emails, where you can actually do online consultations. I found this particularly useful, even as a working woman myself and as a patient, because we are busy moms, we're busy uh, professionals, and sometimes you don't have time during the day, or the phones are engaged, or you're finding it very difficult. And when you go online and sign in an e-consult, ask my GP, you can actually do it at any time and it's usually seen and processed within 24 48 hours and then they will get back to you so these are ways again that you should just that should empower you to know that you can easily get help and quite quickly right now carrying on and moving on with our presentation i've put this beautiful picture of the of of, of our princess kate and um I wanted to know who is most up to date on the news if we have someone who's not medical, because I know the doctors, you might be very clued up. Any knowledge of why I might have put her up in this presentation as we start off? Please do talk to me. Just unmute. Oh, three participants raised their hands. I can't see them. Uh, can our moderator help, please, to just um, let someone else speak? Yeah. So raised hands, I'm just finding you. So we've got, bear with me. Where are the raised hands? Codlin, uh, Codlin, sorry. Codlin. Codlin, can you un unmute your mic and just tell me why you think I've put Princess Kate um, at the beginning of our presentation? Two seconds. Yeah, I've got um, you. You're through? I'm not quite sure, but I've been following the media and I think um, they said she's got mental problem. I'm not quite sure of it, if it's true or if it's just a scam or something. I'm not sure. I am not very familiar with the mental health problem, but, you know, I know she's... Can I try? <laughs> Yeah, she's got an interest in a minute, Kiki. Um, I know she, she's got an interest in mental health. I've got an interest in mental health as well. And I think it's important to just highlight that as well, because when you suffer from cancer, as you can imagine, you may also suffer from a lot of mental health problems because it is a very scary thing to go through. You think about yourself, you think about your family, you think about, you know, so many things. And a lot of people may suffer anxiety, depression, mood disorders. So it may be true she's got mental health issues. I'm not aware of that, but um, that's not why I put her. So Kiki, give us a go, please. Well, yesterday she said she had cancer. Yeah, that's right. Thank you so much, Kiki. So um, uh, Princess Kate announced that she had surgery, which initially wasn't thought to be um, cancerous, but afterwards they discovered that she's got cancer and actually she's going to start, in their words, preventative um, chemotherapy. She's going to be going through treatment. So she made an announcement last night and I thought, oh, how timely is that and how courageous of her when you look into her eyes, you know, for someone going through such a tough time to be able to face the cameras and say, this is what I'm going through. It is also good to raise awareness. And I think it's also timely that we are having this conversation as black women in 
International Women's Health Month, um, just so that we can remove the stigma and fear and also empower ourselves in order to know how we can know, identify risk factors and also how we can know when to worry. So well done. I also thought while I'm on on this picture, just to share a bit of news as well that I learned on a personal level, um, just um, yesterday, a relative of some family friends of ours actually died um, in Zimbabwe from um, from uh, cervical cancer. So, you know, it really struck a raw chord for me and I suppose highlighted the importance of us making this time so again you know a pat on the back to all of us for um for making it and and particularly to the network for organizing this conversation right moving on so as i've mentioned my aim today is I would like to raise together with the rest of the team to raise awareness of cervical cancer and also increase our confidence on how we can prevent it and hopefully breaking that down into objectives and more detailed information of what we're going to cover. We're going to talk about some risk factors and perhaps why um, us as black women in particular may be prone to, you know, getting cervical cancer um, uh, much more and why we die much more and at a younger age um, than other ethnicities. We would cover importance of screening as well as vaccination and um, together with that, how it all can be dictated early and what the treatment options are. We've got a hand, Anna, if you want to unmute yourself and do talk. Anna? Yes. Uh, just Hello. give me a second, please. Yes, I've yes, got... I like to show my face, but I can't. It doesn't That's let good. me. So, yeah, I just wanted to go back really on the fact that you said regarding the fast track two weeks mm. uh, for cancer. But I, unfortunately, it's not happening as it should be. Mm. I have like um, an example with a friend. Hmm. She found a lump under um, uh, armpit. She went to the doctors and she got like as well some patches on her skin. Mm -hmm. And the doctor uh, initially said, oh, I'll send you for a scan. Mm -hmm. By the time she got home, the doctor called her and said, like, actually, I'm going to prescribe some antibiotics first, take it for a week and then come back to us. Eventually she did. The lump didn't, you know, there was slightly decrease on the size of the lump. She went back to the doctor's. And the doctor said, I'll give another uh, set of, uh, uh, of antibiotics for a week. But at this time, I went with her because she's very concerned. She's over 45. And I told, I asked the doctor, can you not at least send her for uh, some blood screens? Because, you know, you can have some like odd results on the bloods and you can actually, you know, see if there's something else than just uh, like an infection. So, oh, but that's might be just an infection. I told her, but... She needs no infection. It is. It's not just giving antibiotics, but now the doctors is very. It's not doing what it should be doing. To be honest, so how can we go past that? Because mm -hmm. about Kate, there was a doctor saying that we should always know normal, get to know our body, but then ask for a second opinion. But how can you ask for a second opinion under the NHS? is very difficult, I, as you know. Sorry, can I just so, interrupt? Just so we, just so that we can have Dr. Shiro, just because we do need to get the cervical cancer message out first. Yes. Can we? Okay. Can I delay answering that question till the end, Anna? If that's okay, All because right. although it's related to cancer, um, it's not directly related in terms of the two-week rule. I understand what you mean, but. I think we're talking more about misdiagnosis and about advocating for ourselves and people we know. So can we, okay. I will remember, to, I will rem mm. remind you at the end. And mm. if I forget, please remind me. But right. we'll yes. deal with that at the end, please. Is All that right, okay? that's fine. Thank you, Anna, for your question. And I any would questions, you can put any questions in the chat box, but we'll mm. do the questions at the end, please. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Yeah, that's a brilliant question. And hopefully we'll get enough time to just uh, cover that. 
Right. So moving on, diving straight into cervical cancer. So what is cancer? You know, what is uh, cervical cancer? Basically, when we talk of cancer, we mean that there is an abnormal growth. Um, as you know, our bodies are made up of cells, individual cells, which are grouped into different types of cells, which make up different parts of our bodies. So our cells usually have a mechanism that if they are damaged, they can repair themselves. But sometimes when our cells are damaged or they are changed due to a number of factors like infection, uh, like radiation, like damage from outside, so many uh, factors, and there's a failure for that damage to be corrected, that can cause uncontrollable growth of cells. And this uncontrollable growth of cells that the body can't switch off is essentially what then results in cancer because the cells start from where they are and they begin to grow into neighboring uh, tissues or neighboring organs. And then they begin to affect how those different parts of our bodies work. So that's in essence what we mean when we say cancer. Now, sometimes growths or tumors can be cancerous or non-cancerous. So I've explained what cancer means, but sometimes you can have a lump that is not cancerous. And I don't know, this might start to answer Anna's question because sometimes when lumps come to the doctors, they are thinking through in their mind, is this lump cancerous? Is this lump non-cancerous? If it's non-cancerous, it can just be what we call a benign growth um, things like uh, uh, polyps, you know, sometimes that can happen, that can happen, or sometimes even infections, things like boils, um, uh, which can happen in the body, which are basically infl inflamed lumps. So sometimes these are treatable. But when we talk of cancer, we're talking of this abnormal growth that cannot be switched off. The overview in my introduction that I wanted you to know is that, yes, lumps, if you notice lumps or any symptoms that may indicate cancer, they need urgent medical attention and you should seek uh, help as we've been talking about. Now, um, most cancers, actually, there's a lot of cancer research that's been happening over the last few decades and we're making a lot of progress with different types of cancers um, and a lot of them are treatable. Cervical cancer is one of that or one of those cancers and they need they usually need um, obviously testing specialist testing which we'll talk about later and also um, the vaccination. So let's just clear up i mean we've already started to talk about facts and figures from our introduction but i just wanted to highlight that worldwide um as i've mentioned even with this personal story of my of our family friend who passed away yesterday worldwide cervical cancer still comes up as about sort of second third most commonest form of cancer, especially in the developing countries. However, in the UK, it's actually gone down to being the 14th most common type of cancer in the UK. And this is as a result of all the hard work that's been happening with the treatment, with the screening. And what we found is actually the incidence or the number of people who are developing this cancer are actually falling. The number of people who are also suffering from cancer at any particular time have actually been halved. Um, and this prevention, again, is due to health awareness, information, the effective screening program that's in the UK. So um, one of the other reasons why I thought to start with the picture of Princess Kate is because of her age. She's 42. She falls I'm not saying that she's got cervical cancer. Her diagnosis has not actually been revealed. So please don't misquote me. But she falls into the group of women like you and me between the ages of 25 and 45 where cervical cancer is most common. It can still happen when people are older, even when they are postmenopausal 
it can happen in younger people less than uh, 25 years, but it's quite rare. And this is why the screening program is structured the way it is and will come on in I'll come on to that in a moment. There are a number of factors, obviously, that may increase one's risk, things like family history. Um, and as we have said, there is um, higher incidence amongst Black populations because of issues. Um, well, we don't know the exact cause, but the the what's highlighted in the studies is that it may be to do with um, our genetics. It may be to do with more importantly, access to health care and the quality of care that we receive once it's been organized. I thought to just put that diagram in case somebody's thinking cervix, where is it? Where am I? So here we've got the female body. That's our reproductive organs. The cervix is also called the neck of the womb. This is the womb where we uh, nurture babies uh, from the beginning. And this is the, the neck of the womb is basically the first part that the babies come out and usually it's quite closed and it's healthy but sometimes it can get damaged and it can develop cancer as we are talking about. Now I want you to also pay attention to surrounding organs because sometimes you may not get classic symptoms of cervical cancer but you may start to get for example problems with the urine because I, the cervix is pressing on, on the surrounding parts or things like that. Um, so it's also quite worth uh, bearing that in mind. Now, so what sort of factors uh, will put someone at risk? We've already covered health inequalities, but the main one that I want us to take away is the um, uh, human papilloma virus infection. It's been found that actually 99 out of 100 of women with cervical cancer usually also have been infected with this, what we call HPV vaccine. The HPV vaccine is a very common vaccine, sorry, not vaccine, HPV virus is a common virus that can occur usually around the mouth, around the genital, it's easily passed on from one person to another, and there's different forms of it. Um, and um, particular two ones, there's particular two strains that cause the cancer, but this is what we try and diagnose and screen when people have their smears. Having sexually transmitted infections, being a smoker is one of the reasons um, uh, why one might be at more risk of having cervical cancer. Being sexually active quite early on in life is a risk factor. Um, just bear with me. I think my, just two seconds because my, um, my power is just switched off. I just want to make sure. Apologies for that, that we don't get interrupted because of the battery. Okay. So being sexually active too early in life um, may put somebody at risk of having cervical cancer, having multiple sexual partners. Um, and also there's been found to be a link between using the oral contraceptive pill and also cervical cancer. Now I must stress that this risk is only a slight increase, about 10% increased risk after using the pill for over five years. And this risk may even increase after 10 years. But more importantly, when one stops using the oral contraceptive pill, that risk starts to decrease. And they've actually found that after 10 years, you're actually not at increased risk anymore after stopping the combined pill, that's what I mean. So it's just something to bear in mind, especially when you talk about your contraceptive option. Options. Now, moving on swiftly, because I know there are people who are very curious, how do I know if I've got cancer? When should I worry? So what are the symptoms? What are the things that you might experience if you've got cervical cancer? Now, you may not have any symptoms for a number of reasons. The diagram that I showed, which shows where the cervix sits and that it's part of the pelvis or the tummy, the area can have quite enough space that sometimes if 
the cancer is affecting the outer part, you may not quickly notice symptoms. So this is why it's important to engage with the screening program, which we'll come on to talk about, because sometimes you might not notice any symptoms. And some of the cases, a lot of the cases are actually picked up from that screening program. Now, the other thing you might have is abnormal vaginal discharge. You might experience some pain. You might also experience abnormal vaginal yeah. bleeding. Sorry, can we mute everybody? Thank you. Um, you might also experience some abnormal vaginal bleeding, inter uh, bleeding in between your periods. So we should all as women, we should be aware of when our periods happen. If we start bleeding, in between, let's say one week after your period has stopped or two weeks after your period you stopped, three weeks after your period has stopped and you're not using any contraception. I say that because some contraception can cause irregular bleeding. Um, you should highlight this to your GP. If you're not sure, discuss this again with your GP or healthcare professional because they will help you to tease that out, the information out. If you notice any bleeding, particularly after sex, what we call postcoital bleeding, then you must report that immediately. And then also if you have any bleeding, after you've reached menopause, we usually define postmenopausal bleeding as any bleeding that occurs over 12 months after you've stopped having periods, you must report that straight away because it might be a sign that something is not um, going well there. If sex is uncomfortable or it's painful, unusually, and obviously the obvious things have been sorted out, things like dryness, infection around the um, vagina, then you need to be reporting this to the GP. Um, even if it's not because of cancer, there are other things. I'm very particular about women also enjoying a healthy sexual life. Um, and so even if it's not cancer, it's important that you get support to make sure that you enjoy sex. And we know we've got evidence that sex is good for our health for a number of reasons. Now, lastly, the other symptoms, and these usually okay quite late, but Again, it's to say if you've experienced them, especially for more than two weeks, more than four weeks, you should be looking to um, speak to your GP, maybe have a conversation, simple uh, examination done and also blood test done. What we call constitutional symptoms, these are non-specific symptoms which may not necessarily indicate cancer, but it's that umbrella term where they could indicate that something is going on. And I've listed quite a few there. We've talked about the mental health symptoms that can be a symptom, but more importantly, tiredness, fatigue, weight loss. And when I say weight loss, I mean unintended weight loss um, that's sustained. You're not trying to lose weight, but you just find that your weight is going down. So you need to be getting help about that. So now you've presented, um, I thought to just uh, slide in here to talk about the fact that obviously prevention is better than cure. Um, in younger people, because of the prevalence or because of how common um, the HPV infection is, and we know that it's so important in the development of cervical cancer, there is a program to make sure that children, in fact, from a time when they are um, uh, sexually active or even before they are sexually active, they can get vaccination to prevent them getting this infection. So we've got a program now that's recommended for children between the ages of 12 to 13. And this is usually provided via the school. I actually have a friend who has received a letter from the school uh, saying, we would like to offer this to your child. Is this okay? So watch that out if you've got young children, um, because that is a very important part of prevention. Now, the other thing is sometimes there are people who have missed out on this vaccination, particularly the vaccination now include boys. And if a boy who was born after 2006 
or maybe a girl who is less than 25 but they were not vaccinated they can also get a ketchup vaccine um via they should ask either their school or um vaccination teams in school if there's one because i understand this may differ from place to place or even ask their gp surgery if they would be able to provide this for them i thought to just highlight the next uh, four points because cervical cancer doesn't just happen to women but it happens to all people with a cervix as we may know and i know it's a controversial topic but there we have transgender people people who may have been born as women so they've got the organs however they transition and they change to be men again they need to uh be screened and they also can access uh the vaccine sex workers people with hiv aids men who have sex with men all of these are people who are not particularly um under the umbrella of you know you have a cervix but they can access this vaccination it's also important because the same um infection can cause other types of cancers, not just cervix, but things like anal cancer, vulval cancers, oral cancers. So this is again um, important to bear in mind, but obviously we're not covering that today. I just put this slide to highlight that there are many different types of the virus and the ones that cause um, uh, uh, cancers are those. And then I'll just whiz through that. And then if we have time, we'll come back because I'm very conscious of our time. Now, so screening, we started out our talk to, uh, with the show of hands of who has had their cervical smear well done. So that's what a speculum looks like. If you've been to your GP uh, or seen your practice nurse, it's actually usually done by the practice nurses. They'll use that little instrument to open up um, the vagina in order to be able to view the neck of the womb or the cervix and see if there is any obvious abnormalities. But normally in a smear test, they take a little brush, which they um, take some samples of those cells we were talking about that get abnormal, and then they send it off to the lab so that it can be tested. Um, you get reminders for this because as GPs were very passionate about people taking on their smears and usually results as well are posted. Now, when cancer is picked up or abnormal cells, this, this, this um, screening is not there to diagnose cancer, but what it is there is to pick up abnormal cells before they change on to become cancer. I hope you're following that because that's quite important. Um, because when you're told that you've got abnormal cells after a smear, it doesn't mean you've got cancer. What it means is you are now at a higher risk of developing cancer. Therefore, we need to take action. And you should probably pat your back for actually, you know, engaging with your healthcare provider. But once those abnormal cells are identified, they are removed. They can be destroyed by freezing, burning, laser, or cutting them away. So this is what the specialists do. Um, and that's not the jobs of the GP, but this is what they do when you're referred to hospital. So... I put this here just to remind us all that if you're under 25, six months before you turn 25, you will get your first invitation. The routine recalls or when you're invited for a smear is every three years from the ages of 25 to age of 49. And from the age of 50 to 64, it's every five years. Screening usually stops at the age of 65. However, there's always caveats to this. If you're over the age of 65 and have um, if and have not had a cervical smear since the age of 50, for whatever reason, you may also be offered screening. Or if your recent cervical screening test was abnormal, as a way of follow-up, they may offer you more screening. So let's say... Um, you have had your smears done, you've had your vaccination done because we've been talking about prevention is better than cure. However, things still fell through and you found yourself um, as, you know, diagnosed or find yourself diagnosed with uh, um, cervical cancer. What, 
happens? What happens? What do we do? The first thing so important is to empower ourselves again with knowledge, education, awareness of not just the condition, but of the resources and the services that are around you to support you. Early presentation, we've talked about talked about GP consultation and what GPs will do when you present with any symptoms. Uh, staging refers to the scans, the series of scans that you have when you have a diagnosis of cancer to find out how bad it is, how big it is, how far it spread from the original site, because all of these factors will then determine what kind of treatment is available for you. The earlier it's caught, for example, when it's still localized to the cervix, you can easily have simple procedures um, that we've been talking about. When it spreads locally, you can have what we call a hysterectomy, which is when they take out your womb and the neck of your womb. Uh, and there's different types of those hysterectomies. Obviously, you would speak to your specialists. Um, to also note, if you're very young and you want to have children and your cancer has been caught quite quickly, this is also another point of hope. You can have a procedure or a surgery that's called trachelectomy, where they try to preserve the womb. And then they um, basically close, they remove the cervix or the part of the cervix that's affected with cancer, and then they close uh, whatever is left behind, they close the womb so that you can then have a good chance of carrying a baby. If that happens, it will be monitored closely. Um, uh, and of course, you know, there are other issues to do with it, but that's something we can talk about later. later. Then chemotherapy re refers to any medication treatment that may be used in order to try and kill the cancer cells. Radiotherapy uses some uh, radiation, again, which can be targeted in different parts of the body. Um, all this treatment can be done in order to cure. That means to try and get rid of all that cancer. Or sometimes, if the cancer has been caught quite late, it can be done to try and prolong your life, what we call palliative treatment. Um, but yeah, because of time, I will just move on uh, uh, to that. So by now you may be thinking, well, so I've been found to have cancer. What do, what, you know, what's my outlook? You know, what's the future like? Um, the prognosis or outlook is generally quite good, as I have said. When it's localized, at least eight to nine women out of 10 will survive and actually they'll be treated. So this is wonderful news, isn't it? Um, but... Um, a lot of women as well will survive for um, at least five years compared to um, women who are much older. So the younger you are, the better. Again, just to highlight that this is an area that's still developing um, and uh, that's improving. So in the future, we might even have more treatments, more procedures, which mean that uh, the outlook continues to improve. Sorry. Now, we are almost finished so that we can try and answer some questions and have a good discussion. But I put I thought to put this um, um, a slide to just highlight quite a few important resources that are good for us as black women. Shout out to my friend, um, Angela Essiwe, who is also my colleague. She's a GP with a special interest in sexual health. And she's the one who shared the first link with me, which is a support group for black women who are experiencing any type of cancer. So please note that down. Um, or maybe our coordinators, we can share this on our social media handles, um, just so that women have got access to this, but it's basically a support group of black women who suffered from different cancers, including cervical cancer, um, to encourage each other from, um, you know, conversation. They are coffee mornings. They do quite a lot of things to try and support um, people from our ethnic background when they're facing a diagnosis of cancer. There's what's called the Jaw Trust. Um, again, have a look, but it 
I love this website because it explains all these complicated treatments, which I tried to summarize in the uh, time that we had, but it explains it more in detail in very simple language that's easy to understand. So it's really worth looking at um, if you've never heard of it before. And many of us might have come across Macmillan Cancer Support they also have quite a lot of resources for supporting women, including us Black women uh, who are um, uh, suffering from cervical cancer. Now, I also just want to stress, you know, it's proven time and time again that especially in the UK, we have a lot of information, we have a lot of resources, the government does a lot of programs to raise awareness. But for one reason or, or another, and sometimes this is put down to health beliefs, uh, fear factors, um, and maybe we can even have a discussion at the end about what it is that might prevent people from accessing help. But it's been proven time and time again that we don't seem to be taking up uh, the services and be using information and these support groups as much as other ethnicities. So if there's one thing I particularly want to take want us to take home with is we are going to make a difference in that regard by just really knowing what's available to us, what our rights are in the NHS and how we can access all these services in a timely um, way. Now, I'm almost finished. Let I hope this won't give me problem, but I just want to summarize everything we've talked about, thanking you for your attention and engagement. And then after that, we can uh, dive on into the questions. Please confirm that you can see that. Um, Thank you so much. Okay. How Ever noticed how some people don't seem to age? I'm in shock. For anyone who hasn't heard about this you. new second anti-aging hack, you... Cervical you. cancer is a cancer of the neck of the womb. It can occur at all ages, but it's most common in women between the ages of 30 and 45 years. Most cases of cervical cancer are due to a common sexually transmitted infection called human papillomavirus, or HPV. The virus affects the cells on the neck of the womb, causing them to change. And these changes can be picked up in screening programs such as your cervical smear. The symptoms of cervical cancer are usually abnormal bleeding, vaginal discharge, or sometimes pain. The diagnosis of cervical cancer starts with uh, cytology or smear testing and then a colposcopy, looking at the cells of the womb in close up and actually taking a biopsy to look under the microscope and make the final diagnosis. The treatment for cervical cancer depends on the stage of the cancer when the diagnosis is made. But thanks to our cervical screening program, most cases are picked up in the precancerous stages and are easily treated with simple techniques to remove the abnormal cells and no major surgery is required. If the cancer is a little more advanced, you may require a formal operation and even a hysterectomy in some advanced cases accompanied by radiation treatment. Nowadays, advanced cervical cancer is extremely rare thanks for the most part to our effective cervical screening program. Girls that during their teenage years are offered an HPV vaccine, which eventually will eradicate the problem. And all young and middle-aged women are strongly advised to go for regular cervical smear tests. These tests identify the precancerous cells, which then means that treatment and removal of these cells can be undertaken swiftly and before the disease becomes more established. Wonderful. We're losing a lot of women unnecessarily, you and can. I think we shouldn't. We can't lose very encouraging testimonials there online, which you can go. I, I'll ask again our coordinators to share that link, which is uh, here in my summary, um, so that women can go and listen to these very encouraging videos. I think my last slide was about references. And um, yes, I'm just coming out. Is that right? Yes. Oh, there you are. 
Thank you so much for that, Dr. Shura. That was fantastic. You are welcome. It's been a pleasure, yes. Did it, it make sense yeah. to you? If I start with yes. you, then you worry. <laughs> well, I'm medical, so I'm, I'm probably not the best person to ask, but yes. Yes, yeah. okay. Well, I suppose maybe it, it could be some looking at something in a way that you haven't thought about before. Or... Yes, definitely, mm. yeah. And I think the, for me, the key takeaway was about, um, and it's a question that I get asked as well quite a bit about um, having a smear, can I have a smear, I'm worried I have cancer or things like that, like the, the smear actually doesn't equals cancer diagnosis. Yeah. I think that's quite important. Yeah. That's right. And actually what you just reminded me by saying that is the screening test, the smear test actually has been found to be very good. So, you know, as healthcare professionals, we talk about sensitivities, specificities or negative predictive mm -hmm. values. I'm just going to break that down into simple language. What it means that if for people who actually have the disease, it's been shown to pick up a, a quite a high number of women who are affected. That means if you test, um, if you uh if you if you are picked up to have abnormal cells, the chances that they are actually abnormal is high. So that means we can rely on the test test quite good. But more importantly, if the test is negative which is the case if you are vaccinated, if you're engaging with your healthy lifestyle, not smoking, doing all these nice preventable things, engaging in safe sex. If the test is negative and you're having it regularly every three years, it's actually been found that there's, if you're negative, the chance that it would develop in the next three, five years is actually quite low. And that's why we've got those gaps in between the screening. So that's quite reassuring for women. Uh, and the reason why I'm highlighting that is if you've had your smear test, let's say last year, and then you notice bleeding this year, you still should go to your GP to be investigated. However, the chances that it will be cancer when you've just had a normal smear last year will be much less. It's not 100%, you won't have cancer or abnormal cells, but you know, that interval is actually quite, um, they found that the, the smear tests are actually quite good in predicting how uh, frequently you might have abnormal cells from um, in between the times of testing. Mm -hmm. Right. So before we move on to the Q&A, I would just like to give a shout out to everybody who is watching us live at the London Inspire Health Fair in London. Um, Hello, everybody. Um, and um, we've got a few questions, if that's okay, Dr. Shiro, that I'd just like to go through uh, with you. Um, okay, fine. So I've got the questions here. Uh, let's go with the first one. So this is from YouTube. So Jessica Petway. Um, beauty influencer sadly died of cervical cancer after being misdiagnosed misdiagnosed with fibroids several times. How can we prevent such misdiagnoses happening, please? Um, that's really unfortunate to hear, I must say, and may she rest in peace. Um, I think how we can avoid that from us taking responsibility as patients is the question directed to us as patients or professionals? Just people. As, huh. as people yeah. in general. Mm -hmm. So as, as people, I think it's already the things that we've covered in the presentation. Engaging mm -hmm. with smears regularly because your records, your GP records, we have an up-to-date of any changes that might occur. And remember, it's picking up abnormal cells which are not yet cancerous. Being aware of our periods and uh, how our bodies feel, you know, we talk of breast examination, for example, checking out for lumps. Somebody has talked about lumps. Um, we talk of noticing when you're bleeding in an unusual way, noticing when sex is uncomfortable. So if you're not having sex, you won't know. <laughs> just to throw it in there. Um, just being 
conscious of all the symptoms that we've talked about and having the confidence to say, right, I need to seek for help. And I want to address briefly also health beliefs. I'm a person of faith as you are, Donobaru. And sometimes I think sometimes we can engage dysfunctionally, if I may say, with our with our with our world views, let me say, and it can confuse thinking. Some people might think, oh, if I admit that I've got a problem or that I've noticed the symptoms, then it means that I'm not praying enough or I don't have faith or maybe someone from my village is throwing things at me and I'm being bewitched. You know, there are all kinds of nuanced mm. beliefs that sometimes affect us as black people. And I mean, and also people from all ethnicities, to be fair, mm -hmm. but it's just being aware that it's okay to have those beliefs. We're entitled to freedom of thought and conscience and religion. However, we lose nothing by passing it or examining it in the lens of science and in the lens of trusted medical professionals who are also like you and me. And this is why I love this network, isn't it? it this is doctors, healthcare professionals who are also black to say, even if this thing could be true, I lose nothing by just going through a smear. I lose nothing by getting it checked out. And if they find nothing and this is still going on, then maybe, you know, so I just wanted to throw it in there. So that will help to avoid uh, uh, mispresentation and also to empower yourself that when you go, usually good clinicians should be asking you, what are your ideas, concerns, expectations? These are things that you should not feel that um, a doctor only talks to you, you know, that what we call paternalistic um, patient-doctor relationship where the doctor only knows best and just respect the doctor. Feel free it's not challenging in a in a bad way, but feel free to ask questions to say, actually, I was worried about that. How are you reassuring me that it isn't that? Sometimes people can have cancer as well as fibroids together at the same time. So it's not a matter of misdiagnosis. But when you are worried about cancer for whatever reason, if the doctor is not thinking about it, I guarantee you they're thinking about it. But if they don't vocalize to you that they're thinking about it or don't confidently reassure you, have the confidence to speak up and say, please, um, can I... Uh, how how can we address this concern that I have that it might be cancer? And also talk about why you might be afraid that that's the case. And then just a note of word to us all as clinicians. When patients are worried about something, we must listen. I think I've had so many um, uh, conversations with lay people in the community saying, doctors need to listen, doctors need to listen. And also my experience as a patient, I find that sometimes because of pressures that we have, because of all kinds of factors, sometimes we can have laps in, lapses in, you know, but if you listen to the patient, if you follow up the patient, you know, say, I don't think it's cancer, but maybe come back, you know, in a few days. So what we call safety netting in general practice is very important. Sometimes things are not a concern when you see a healthcare professional, but that doesn't mean they might not develop to be a concern. It could be when she was seen with fibroids, it was just fibroids and everything else considered, there was no indication that there was cancer. But in the time period to when things became worse, she may then have developed cancer. Do you see where I'm coming from? So all mm -hmm. of those nuances of dynamics in interpersonal relationships and doctor-patient relationships, they need to be explored. But as women, we must not lose our voice. We must speak up and we must, and, and speaking up, being assertive does not have to be aggressive. It does not have to be problematic. It does not have to be seen as negative complaints all the time because all these things will hold us back. What will they think about me? How will I appear? Will my GP still treat me the same if I go back and I go back and I, I am insisting that I'm very worried about this? We can actually find a way to communicate these things. I hope I've that's partly, at least partly answered the question.
Yes, thank Good. you. I think so I guess it's related, I guess, to mm -hmm. Anna, does that answer your question, um, yeah. Anna, about advocating as well, you know, where mm -hmm. someone has gone to the GP, Anna's friend had gone to the GP a number of times mm -hmm. um, and um, hadn't actually been referred. So th the issue, I think, being that the two-week rule hadn't come into effect because there was no referral actually made. Does that sort of answer your question, Anna? I don't know if you can unmute yourself or yes. just type in the chat box. It would be good, actually, if she can just talk, because obviously that was a really yeah. good question that I wanted us to. Yeah, make. it is a good question. Anna, you can unmute now. Uh, yeah, no, yes, thank you. Yeah, it kind of, yes. But it just, um, yeah, I realise because of my own personal experience as well, that we need to advocate for ourselves as as much as you can, and if we can't do it, we always, you know, got a friend, someone that is more willing to do or more not afraid to do it. But thank you so much for raising and asking the yeah. question. Thank you. Do you mind sharing Anna what lump it was, where it was? Uh, the armpits, and the the, the, mm -hmm. the only thing is because she got other symptoms as well. What mm -hmm. I found maybe. The doctor might think the lump is not related with uh, breast cancer. But I had another friend, the same. She had a, a lump. After six months, she had gone back to the doctors. Mm -hmm. Actually, it was breast cancer. She's been dismissed and she, she had a mastectomy. So, mm -hmm. like, we heard these things on and on and again and again. And, like, getting a second opinion, as I was saying, a doctor saying regarding to Kate, it's always good to... Get a second opinion, but if you're under NHS, get a second opinion. Oh, unless you've got yeah. private care. Mm. Mm. It's hard. Uh, sometimes you, you get, it's so frustrated. It's like you're not being heard by the doctors because I'm a person living with HIV, but I was diagnosed only because I was persistent, persistent with my symptoms. Mm. I've been hospitalized for five days and as, I've been dismissed. And, the, you know, at the time I asked for uh, to be screened for everything. And they put me down as a kidney stones on the lower back and my back. Uh, sorry, I had like back problems. And they said, oh, got kidney stones. And like for six months, I was trying to understand what was happening to my body. And then my doctor said, you were lucky because two years down the line, it could be, it could be that. Although it's not like it was an early infection. The damage was already, you know, too much damage into my body. So it's just like we are afraid because we, we've not been heard by doctors. And yes. how can we... Oh, it's just so difficult. I'm so afraid, you know, in terms of my friend. But I, I'm I'm with her and I'll do anything that I can, you know, to help her out. Mm. But because mm. I had this bad experience with myself now. Yes. I'm to advocate, but... Yeah. Mm. I'm, I'm so sorry to hear of your experience, Anna, but um, I just wanted to say, you know, it... it, it hindsight is a very beautiful thing and once a problem has been picked up it's very easy isn't it to see how things should have been but sometimes the challenge that healthcare professionals and all of us have is before we get to that diagnosis the truth of the matter is not every lamp not every problem not every symptom as i've tried to explain in my presentation is because of cancer in fact part of um our training as gps when we are counseling people about referring them onto the two week wait pathway one of the things that we actually mention is over 90, 95% of people that we refer onto the two week on pathway actually come out and it, it is not cancer. Mm. These are screening tests. Um, which are obviously aimed at picking up rates, but actually they may not end up being cancer, which so as doctors, we also don't want to unnecessarily put people through um, harmful investigations, the worry, the, the mental health impact that it can also have when it's nothing, but then you've got these symptoms that need to be investigated. So for us as clinicians, getting that balance right, I'm not trying to defend the actions of the healthcare professionals, can be quite difficult. It's just something for us to bear in mind. But if you have a reason why you're really concerned, then I think it's it's really important that you um, 
highlight. I just want to, with the permission of our moderator, to actually allow my colleague Angela to speak because she's just done a cancer presentation actually um, to another community as well. So I think she might have something to contribute, which is very helpful. Thank you. Angela, thank you if you can unmute yourself. Um, hello, hi, I'm Dr. Angela Siwe. Um, um, I'm glad to be listening to this presentation. And from a point as a GP, I'm just listening to what Anna had to say. Um, yeah, I think if you or, or or your friend are concerned about anything, you can get a second opinion within a GP surgery in the sense you can ask to see another GP. Um, that shouldn't affect your care. And yes, the other route, like you said, frustratingly, is going private. I've been a patient, but for different reasons. And I, I had to go privately in the end because I was frustrated with the NHS, even though the NHS is, is wonderful. Um, but in some cases, um, if you don't feel heard, you have to, to go elsewhere. But yes, there are so many differentials for lumps or for or, or for bleeding from the vagina and so on so and look fortunately in a lot of cases we tend to quote that when you are referred to one of these specialist clinic only usually about one in ten are cancer nine out of ten aren't but it's important to go through that journey mm. so uh, that was just the comments i wanted to make thank you no thank you very much Great. Fabulous. So if we, we probably don't have time for all the questions, so I'll try and rattle through as much as we can. Mm -hmm. um, so going back to my list. So the next question, which I think is important to, I'll come back to the question about the labia vulva cancer, just one second. But uh, the other question that we had was why is screening not done over the age of 65? Because people can still be sexually active after 65. Oh, that's a very good question. So what, um, it's actually quite an interesting process that they go about in order to design a, a screening program. Uh, these different factors uh, that are taken into account when um, uh, designing a screening program. So one of them is what we call the prevalence, how common it is and how many people suffer uh, from this condition at one time. Whilst you're technically correct that if you're over 65, you're sexually active and you may still be at risk, I think this is why um, that uh, provision is there to say if you notice any symptoms or anything like that, you should be presenting. But if you've been in the system and have been followed up up to the age of 65, the studies that they have done have actually shown that the chances of that being the case, that it being cervical cancer, with what we know of how it's caused, with what we know with the age group that's mostly affected, the chances are really low. So it's a balance of, and there are many other considerations to do with systematic cost effectiveness and all these things, not causing harm, unnecessary worry, why the screening programs wouldn't extend to beyond that. That's the same reason why we don't have a screening program for everything. Because if you think about it, we suffer from different conditions. Why don't we just have screening programs for everything? It's finding the right kind of tests for the right kind of people, for the right kind of duration that will make it a worthwhile thing to do. So I, I hope I've kind of answered your question there. But I think it goes back again to health awareness. If you're that in that age group where you're over 65, you notice bleeding or anything like that, then you should be you should be seeking help. Okay, I guess. The next question is related to that, in, but the other spectrum. Um, can you, I'm going to add my own. So can you have a smear test if you're a virgin? Or I guess I should say my part is, should you have a smear test if you're a virgin, but at the age of screening, right. over the age of okay. screening? Can you? Thank you for uh, differentiating the two words underlined. Can you? Yes, you can. 
I have friends who've done that. I personally didn't, but that was because I was living in another country and all kinds of factors. Yes, you can. And in fact, they say if you're if you reach the age of 25 and you can tolerate the procedure, you know, talk to someone, educate yourself, videos. Um, if you're worried about, you know, it's about highlighting your concerns about having it what, what, when you're a virgin. And obviously we know the speculum is not a very small um, instrument, but if you can tolerate it, the, the mild discomfort, yes, you can. Whether you should, now that's a bigger question because it goes on to assessing the risk. If you've are a virgin and you've never been sexually active what do you mean by a virgin you've never had sexual intercourse um because you can still be put at risk with other sexual activity that's not necessarily breaking your virginity things like kissing oral sex so you can still be at risk so that's one thing to say but if you're absolutely sure that you um maybe you've had a screening for STIs for example that you don't have an infection and you've never been sexually active what they actually say in the literature is that the risk your risk of developing cancer at that point is actually quite low because of the links again of HPV to cervical cancer. So it's an individual consideration and decision. Um, but if you decide not to, because obviously you're worried that it might break your virginity or, you know, it might be too uncomfortable for you or traumatic. I'm saying this because I actually know a friend who's gone through this. Then you want to get all that information to say, OK, if you're really sure you've never been sexually active, you've never been diagnosed with the sexual health problem, you might want to wait until such a time that you are sexually active and then you get screened. However, the official advice is still, it, it's a matter of age. Once you're that age, if you could tolerate the procedure um, and you read up about it, then we encourage you to, because of all these other different factors of um, how it may happen. Actually, the other thing that I remembered is there are also types of cervical cancer, very rare, other types of cervical cancer or, can, or problems around that area which may not have anything to do with sexual intercourse. Sometimes they are related to if you're at risk, uh, for example, people who've got certain uh, genetic problems or are prone to certain syndromes or collection of disease that may include cervical cancer. If you think about it, even if you are still a virgin, you may benefit. So it's about knowing your family, knowing your family history, knowing whether those kind of risk may still be there in which may justify or which may be make getting a smear test a wise thing to do even if you're not sexually active. I'm happy to get help from my colleagues here and I hope I've answered it astutely. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, that's great. Mm. So um, I don't know if we have time for absolute last one, just really, really quickly. Mm. If you've had a hysterectomy, do you still need screening? Right, uh, so with the hysterectomy, it depends what type of hysterectomy you had done. I didn't go into the detail. There's what's called a simple hysterectomy or a total hysterectomy where they take out the uterus because that's what we mean by hysterectomy and they also take out the cervix. If you've had that and sometimes they even take out part of the vagina, if you've had that then you don't need any further screening. However, sometimes you can have procedures where part of um, uh, the cervix, you might have had a hysterectomy, but part of, this, or part of the cervix or the whole cervix has been left behind, in which case you still need to have your cervical smears up, absolutely. Great. And I'll have to stop there. I'm really sorry for the questions that we didn't get to. Um, I know some people have also then since typed about concerns and things and I don't want you to go and think that we've ignored your concerns if you've got mm -hmm. remember what Dr Shura said if you've got personal concerns about your health please please speak to your clinician whether that be your GP or if you are seeing a specialist for anything else 
um, it is worth mentioning because they can also advocate on your behalf both ways. Okay. Yeah. Other clinicians can be your advocate, nurses, that sort of thing. So do please tell somebody. If you're worried you have cancer, please don't be shy. I'll reiterate what Dr. Shura said and literally say to your doctor, I think I've got cancer. Yeah. You really need to say that because I think that's really important when you have these consultations not to be sort of uh, beat around the bush. If you think you've got cancer or it's something that's concerning you, say, I am concerned about cancer. It's not going to sound silly because you, if you can't make sense of it, you're not there to make sense of your symptoms. That's what healthcare professionals are there to. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's the best way to advocate for yourself. Um, I'm just stealing what Dr. Shuro said, but thank you, Dr. Shuro. And I'm now going to hand over to Natasha. Hello, everyone. First of all, thank you so much, Dr. Vaughn, your first health hour, and it's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Dornu, I mean, you've been incredible advocate for health hour in, in the two that you have done. And this conversation was really important. I think there was a lot of interaction. You could see people really open up. And I wanted to thank you as well to the people that came forward, shared their stories. It's mm -hmm. about that, isn't it? Vocalizing and, and showing that we're not alone. There mm -hmm. are support groups. There are uh, a black healthcare specialist that can help you and say, you know, your, your story is valid and we're here to hear you. Uh, and not just that, support you. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I've left uh, Khan's general email health at kind of all that UK. If you have any further questions, we can sign post you and, and so on and so forward. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. But that is Black Women Rising, excellent uh, group. We have done things with them, Cancer Care Diaspora. That is also Just Trust. We put all the contacts online. Just wanted to reiterate that is support. Yeah. Uh, reach out to us. Um, so thank you so much for volunteering your time uh, with us. We really appreciate it. So yeah. I just wanted to quickly share with you guys some of the things that Khan has been doing as of now. I have just one screen today. So hopefully I can do this right. Can everybody see my screen? Mm. Sorry if it's not how I normally would do it. Uh, yeah, apologies for starting on the wrong side. So this is the correct slide. So I wanted to, first of all, reiterate that Health Hour happens every single Saturday. So next Saturday, again, we will be here uh, with Health Hour on another relevant uh, uh, health topic and always with a focus on the Black community, your needs, your worries, uh, your challenges, your families, uh, yourself as an individual. So do join us every single Saturday at 11 a.m. We will be here. We soon to announce the topic. On the same line of thought, uh, this Tuesday we have Healthy uh, healthy Hearts. It happens every Tuesday at 6 p.m. because we know a lot of people work during the day. Uh, so we do it in the evening. Again, volunteer nutritionists come and speak to us. This week's topic is about how to support teenagers who have got healthy diets. So if you are a guardian, obviously a parent or a carer, or even a teacher, this is a very important session to understand how to guide them best through their own journey that throws a healthy diet. So it will happen this Tuesday at six o'clock. Uh, now today, oh, the London uh, Inspired Program Health Fair is happening right now, but you're still to join at any time. You don't need to let us know. You can just pop by. I'm soon to uh, go there. Um, so yeah, it's happening until three o'clock. The uh, address is on the screen, Main Hall High in London. Uh, there is the postcode there, but I left all the details on the chat before I started to present. We have a bereavement peer support group uh, in Cannes, completely free of charge. You have the QR code there on the screen if you have your phone at hand and you can scan it. So yes, particular times, but he also has a, a hotline, uh, Rosalind's number that is on the screen. Uh, he has her email address. So you can always drop her an email and she can book you in for some support. As I said, this is completely free of charge and we are very happy to support you through your journey. The scan is all about that really. Uh, so um, onwards, uh, we have um, we are very proud to be on a project that is called Keep Warm and Stay Safe. Uh, stay safe. So it's Black Informed Resilient, Black, Black Informed Resilient Community. 
So it's all about us giving you tips on how to use energy safely, efficiently, but we're also providing household items such as blankets, um, slow cookers, uh, carbon monoxide uh, detector alarms, pieces of clothing, one clothing, uh, plus drop-in sessions in person. Again, on the phone, we also give advice. So we have these items completely free of charge to give to you, plus tips. So uh, honestly, stay uh, get in touch. We have hubs in Manchester and also in London, physical hubs. So do reach out to us and we can uh, help you. So uh, three days to go for the Black Health Inequality Summit is happening this Monday down in London and is all about uh, from recognition to action. So how do we recognize the people that have been working on the system, but we also bring pledges and actions into the system to really improve the health outcomes for Black Londoners. But we know that when it affects one of us, it affects all. So it's very important to interact with us on social media. If you want the resources from the summit, because it's already oversubscribed, it's fully booked. Uh, we are grateful for that. Thank you for the ones that are on the call that are coming. But if you are, if you didn't get a ticket and you still want the resources, just uh, I've dropped the form as well on the chat and you can just uh, sign up for that. Uh, finally, a very important, we have a legal drop-in session on the 28th of March, so this coming week, is by our advocacy team. And they are bringing a session on wills, lasting powers of attorney, estate planning. This is in collaboration with you, John Solicitors, so we have specialists on the area uh, giving you advice, again, completely free of charge. This is an online session, so you just need to log in 6 p.m. on the 28th and we can support you on the session. Uh, don't miss out. It's important that in our communities, we start understanding more about um, what we own, how can it be passed on the generations that we have and generational wealth. I understand this is not important for everyone, but perhaps it's important to be informed, okay? So thank you all so much for joining us on the South Tower on a Saturday morning amazing session i was so happy to be with you all today and i'll see you next week thank you natasha bye welcome to our caribbean and african targeted health improvement program cathip health hour the Caribbean and African Health Network, CAN, along with its national partners, are incredibly pleased to continue to bring to you targeted health and well-being education delivered by Caribbean and African doctors. These health hours are all about empowering, educating and giving space to black people so our communities can look after themselves better. Every Saturday, our black GPs or consultants present on those health and well-being topics that affect you, your family members and friends. Some weeks will vary and will include other panel members such as pharmacists, specialist nurses and faith leaders. Our health hours cover a range of topics and include mental health, heart health, women's health, reproductive and sexual health issues, men's health, respiratory problems, cancer, sickle cell and many more. We have not forgotten to include within our health hours the many societal, cultural, religious and racial challenges that can go hand in hand with health problems and influence how we should respond to meet health and well-being needs. The sessions are designed for you and we want you to use the time to listen, learn, share your experiences and ask questions to our black doctors. During every session, we will gather your feedback so we can continue to respond to the needs of our black community. To request any particular topic, please email health at khan.org.uk. We encourage you to invite others to our Health Hour sessions. Spread the word in our community. CATHIP is funded by the National Lottery Community Fund.